Today I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. Thousands of children are coming across the U.S.'s southern border without adults to take care of them. It's a situation that's being called a humanitarian crisis. Some statistics show that the number of children trying to enter the U.S. has increased by 90 percent over last year. Existing shelters are said to be at capacity, and in California, Oklahoma, and Texas, many of these children are being housed temporarily in military installations. The U.S. Department of Justice announced that it will create a $2 million fund to provide many of these minors legal representation in immigration court. On this show, we'll talk about what is being done locally to address what even President Obama has called an urgent humanitarian situation. Joining me on the show are two immigration attorneys from Community Legal Services of East Palo Alto. Mariam Kelly has practiced immigration law both in nonprofit and private settings in New York and New Jersey. She served as the Kids in Need of Defense Fellow at the American Friends Service Committee in Newark, New Jersey, where she represented immigrant youth facing removal proceedings. Helen Beasley, who is seated on my right, focuses on providing legal services to youth facing deportation. Helen is an active participant in coalition efforts to advance the rights of immigrants and youth in San Mateo County. Helen is from Canada, and like Miriam, she is fluent in Spanish. Well, thank you so much for joining me. It's a delight to have you on the show. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. I mentioned um, just now that there's a 90% increase of young people trying to cross the border over last year. Why is that the case? Any ideas that you can share? So just to kind of provide some background, this is not a new issue. This is something that really has been going on since 2011 or maybe even beforehand. Every year, the number of unaccompanied minors traveling from Central America, from South America, and coming up north through Mexico into the United States, that number has increased, doubled, and tripled. I think at this point, it's up like 400-something percent, you know, but it's something that's been occurring steadily, and then recently, there's been kind of like an increase in numbers, more so than other times. So what's responsible for the current increase? And how is it that we haven't, it's now coming to our attention? For example, I don't think many people even, there was little if any publicity mm -hmm. in 2011 when you said this has basically started, right? Right, it's so interesting how like certain issues will come up into the media and then one outlet will cover them and another one will and then it kind of snowballs and people are like oh this just happened overnight it really hasn't I mean this has been kind of on our periphery as immigration attorneys since at least 2011 I remember like in the early days of you know after law school practicing and getting into immigration law and then speci uh, having specialty with children uh, it was something that these studies were coming out and there were different um, the guidebooks and reports done by different organizations. I remember there was one by like the Women's Refugee Commission that was done like back in probably like 2011, 2012 that talked about these like root causes of migration and all the different statistics and numbers. And then just recently, even though this has been something that's been like steadily occurring, um, just it's kind of uh, blown up recently in the media. So uh, it's not because it's something new has happened. It's just, you know, these, it's been steadily occurring and I guess it became uh, a priority for the government. Uh, to provide some kind of funding or some kind of response and then now it's becoming more of like a, an issue that people are paying attention to. I guess because the, the, it seems like right now it's absolutely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. We have seen, you know, uh, as you said, a 90% increase over last year in terms of the number of unaccompanied children crossing the border and being apprehended by Border Patrol. And I think one of the reasons that it really has come to light is because we've run out of space in the sh current shelter system to house these children. Um, there is a, a system set up to make sure that the needs of these children are being met after they've been apprehended by Border Patrol um, to ensure since they are children that, that you know, that their medical needs, psychological needs, and, and needs uh, for education, for example, are met uh, while they're in immigration custody. And so there's a shelter system put in place um, throughout the United States to house these children. Uh, but what we're seeing now, because there is an increase in the number of children, is that the shelters are overwhelmed. 
that there's not enough space for the children. And so instead of being put into a, a child-friendly environment with services for children, uh, they're being housed for longer periods of time in Border Patrol facilities. Uh, and as you said, now on military installations as well, which really aren't equipped to provide services for children. And that's really you know, where we're seeing this urgent humanitarian crisis arising. So I would even think, or some would even doubt the adequacy of the provisions that have been used in the past to care for children. How adequate uh, have they been in the past? I'm thinking even the homeless here, mm -hmm. homeless children aren't necessarily given the type of care that they should mm -hmm. get or attention to their education. Mm -hmm. So there might be even less attention given to immigrant children who've crossed the border. Right, it's kind of interesting. Like, there is good and there's bad. So the there's an agency in place to assess the needs of recent child immigrants that have come over the border. Rather than being handled by ICE, by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, they are handled by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, um, which is part of like, Dep Department of Health and Human Services. So they have a special kind of branch of a different agency handling their detention rather than ICE detention. Because you hear stories of like ICE detention for adults and you know it's pretty much in jail and many of them are housed in county jails. So the good thing is that they're not being held in that kind of system. Instead, it's more of like a shelter system. And it, there are certain instances in which you have, a, we'll have clients, for example, that we come to us and we kind of hear about their experience of being detained. And it is a good thing sometimes that they've had like education for the first time in their lives. Sometimes they've been de completely deprived of education in their home country. And sometimes it, they've gone to the dentist for the first time in their entire lives because those services weren't available to them at home. At the same time, um, these services that are provided to them, I mean, it's never enough. I mean, now that so many children are inundating the system, <clears throat> uh, the push that we've been seeing is that instead of being housed for like a month or two, they're kind of you know putting them in for like a week, two weeks, just to kind of shorten the process because the, the shorter time that they spend in those shelters, the more different kids can be put into them instead of the ones that are being like, you know, the overflow is being put into like airplane hangars on the military installations. So it's just kind of been like a shift in, um, um, how the children are treated and um, the way that children leave detention is that they'll try to match them with family members and so previously like you know a year or two ago the kids would spend three months in the shelter because they want to verify that the family member that they're being matched to is somebody who's not going to harm them and background checks can sometimes be completed and they'll kind of look at who's living in that home and then make the decision that like yes this child should be reunified with that family member aunt uncle cousin brother parent. How, how do officials usually know that there is a family member from the child yeah, oh, the, from the, oh, yeah. so the the relatives that send the child well there's not really anyone that's sending them per se that's kind of um don't tell a lot me that's a myth and the parents <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the parents aren't sending them oh you know the one thing that um i really hope that we can talk about today is the fact that there's so many different stories and children come here for a myriad of reasons and it's not just that they're being sent or you know um it's not always a pull it's more of a push so there's so many different root causes of that migration, but a common scenario that we see in our line of work is that the child is faced with like a desperate situation and needs to get out of their home country. And so they make the plans on their own. I hear over and over of parents that don't even know that their child is coming, that the, the child has been like, oh, mom or dad, can I come be with you? And they're like, no, it's too dangerous. I wanna find you a legal way of coming. And then the child will make their own plans and borrow money from whoever and make their own plans. No, we're talking north. about children at what age? Anywhere from nine years old to 15, 16, 17 years old. I mean, there's... Now, what about toddlers? We've seen a few toddlers, and we know good and well the toddlers didn't make the decision on their own and decide to crawl across. Yeah, maybe not like an extreme like <laughs> toddlers, but it's surprising to me that even a child as much as like nine or 10 years old will make that decision. And, you know, with faced with a desperate situation, uh, human beings can really like push themselves to levels. No, if it's a nine-year-old child and they're going to be reunited with parents in this this country, are those parents legal, usually, or illegal? Um, well, we don't like the terms like illegal or you know legal. It's better it's to better say better than alien. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I hate alien. <laughs> yeah. So I like to refer to them as having some kind of lawful status or being undocumented. Okay. So a lot of times the parents, yeah, you know, it's just um. Uh, 
sometimes the parents are undocumented, sometimes they are lawful permanent residents, you know, if, if there's some kind of legal means to get their children to the U.S., many parents will opt to do that, of course, because it's so much less dangerous and it's um, kind of opening up more possibilities for them in the future and they don't have to deal with this undocumented problem. Um, the problem is that our immigration system really is flawed. And people, you know, a common criticism that I hear is that, oh, they should just wait in line like everyone else does and take their place in the queue and then it'll get to them. But if you really look at the immigration system, there's no line to wait in. Uh, people who emigrate to the U.S. come for employment reasons, they come for family reasons. You have to have some kind of U.S. citizen family member petition for you. A common way of doing it is through a family petition. Those petitions can take 10, 15, 20 years to go through. And that's if they're lucky enough to have a family link to come to the U.S. So people always say, oh, just wait in line. Like, how are you supposed to wait in line if there's no line that you can even wait in, you know? so And you don't know where it is anyway. And yeah. You don't know what number you will be or... Yeah, and even if you can get a number, I mean, let's say that, like, you know, there is no U.S. citizen family member, no lawful permanent resident family member to put a petition in for them, then they have to look for some kind of employment reason. That's, like, one in a million that'll work for. Well, what Miriam is saying, it seems to me, is that when the government attempts to reunite children with family members here, the government knows who those family members are. Yes, they do. And they know where they are, yes, whether they do. they're documented or not documented. Yes, they is do. that usually the case? That is usually the case. And as Miriam was mentioning, normally it, it's the child uh, who has to provide that information. Um, so once the child is put into the shelter system, they have a case manager who's in charge of trying to find some sort of family member or other um, responsible adult to release that child to. And so they'll question the child, you know, who were you coming to, to live with? What were your plans when you left your country? Is there anyone here in the United States um, that you know and that you could live with? And based on that information, they start this reunification process where they investigate, okay, is this a safe home? Is this an adult who wants this child? Uh, sometimes the child thinks they're coming here to live with someone, and then that person, either out of fear for contact with immigration and going through that process of revealing themselves to the federal government, or for financial reasons that they're actually not able to provide for that child, decide, you know what, we don't want that child anymore. And so then that puts that child in a, a very precarious situation of prolonged detention in the immigration system. Now, while they're in that prolonged detention, I think you did indicate that there is access to mm -hmm. education, access to medical care, mm -hmm. and they're better off. And then, usually what happens? For children who are eligible for immigration relief, which many of these children are, there's estimates about 40 to 58 percent of these children are eligible uh, for forms of relief that would allow them to stay permanently in the United States. With parents or without? Uh, either, really. It's 40 to 58 percent overall, and so some of those children are going to have parents and some don't. Uh, that's the overall figure. Um, but for children who aren't able to reunify with a parent or a family member and who are eligible to stay here in the United States, there is a long-term foster care program where these children can be placed and they're living in foster care homes or group home setting um, with you know, many, many more freedoms, um, fewer restrictions, or they're going to regular high schools. Um, they're able, you know, if they are able to obtain uh, immigration status, they're able to work, for example, and send money home. Uh, so there is a system in place to make sure that kids who don't have anywhere to live, uh, you know, don't have anywhere to be released to, are able to live in the least restrictive setting possible. And what happens, um, it was stated that if they're eligible Mm -hmm. Under what circumstances would they not be eligible? So there's to very, stay? Yeah, there's various forms of relief, and um, when we screen children, we see if they're eligible for one of those forms of relief. So um, one scenario that comes up, not I wouldn't say frequently, but sometimes is special immigrant juvenile status. And that's for children who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both of those parents. And they need to have that determination made by a state court, um, some kind of um, court within the United States that has jurisdiction over that child. Now, 
are those children who might have been abused before they got here, or we're talking about abuse while they're here? It could happen either way. Yeah, sadly, and I see it happen both ways. So um, a scenario can sometimes be that um, mom and or dad has never been in the picture and the child was living with a relative and that relative systematically abused that person. I mean, we see cases of sexual abuse, neglect. Um, then the child, out of desperation, flees to come to the United States and then is you know, in the foster care system. So with the foster care system, um, a guardian will be put in place and then that child can have a uh, court order issued naming that uh, somebody as a guardian and then they'll uh, be able to apply for special immigrant juvenile status. If these children are doing this on their own, how do they know about the United States and possible freedom that this country might offer? As, a, as we said, there's a number of different reasons and a number of different factors that influence children's decision to come to the United States. Um, some of them do have family members here in the United States that they are seeking to reunite with. A lot of times it's parents who might have left you know, 10, 15 years ago and these children haven't seen them since then uh, and they're, they're seeking to reunify with that parent or with another family member. And those are the older children? They, they tend would to, have to be. They tend to be the older children um, who are coming and, and searching for a family member. A lot of times what we see are clients who, even though the family member is in the United States, they maintain contact. There's regular phone calls. There are you know, money sent home to help take care of that child. Uh, and the child makes a decision because the situation in their home country is so precarious. They make the decision to take a very dangerous journey to try to reunify with a parent or family member. Um, other children don't have parents or family members here in the United States and it's, it's more of, you know, they've heard that America has all these opportunities, that it's a safe place um, where they can get an education, for example. A lot of these children have to stop attending school either because there isn't a free public school system past a per certain grade or because of fear of gang members in their neighborhoods that they're too afraid to attend school. And so they've heard that there's many more educational opportunities in the United States that they wish to pursue. And so these are children making that decision that they want to be able to you know, have those opportunities and to live in safety, to be able to go to school and not be afraid to go to school. Well, there is a lot in the press that gives one the impression that the children are being brought in by coyotes and it's all maybe drug cartels. Does that uh, correspond to any of the, the information that you have or any of the children that you deal with? Well, and how, how, how valid is that, that information? So coyotes and drug cartels, very separate. So many people who make the journey uh, from their home countries to the United States. I mean, it's a long journey. And it's like- Through the desert. Through, well, through more than just the desert. I mean, you should hear like some of the stories that our clients tell us of how they got here. I mean, it involves planes, I mean, not planes really, but like trains, buses, people ride on tops of the trains. There's a lot of like industrial freight trains that will go through Guatemala and to Mexico and they'll ride on tops of those trains. They can't afford to buy a ticket. Um, and so a lot of times they need somebody to help them through that journey. Because if you get lost, it is the desert and we hear of really sad cases of like skeletons being found in the desert of people trying to make their way north and they got lost and Usually ran out of water. We, we think of adults yeah. but we don't think of children and so now it's like we don't know how many children might have been lost in the desert. It happens. Mm -hmm. There's so many deaths that are related to the journey up north. People also, you know, those trains. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched the movie Which Way Home. It's on Netflix. It's such a great documentary about some kids from Central America making their way up north, and it shows exactly every step of the journey that they go on, you know, leaving their little hometown and then getting to the train station and going from one train to the next train and waiting while, you know, it's safe. And if there's, like, rumors of, like, guards of, like, the, you know, uh, around the, the police around the train stations. They'll wait for a couple of days in these shelters. It's so fascinating just seeing like the different methods that they'll take to come through, you know, and uh, it's not just chill, it's not just adults, it's so many children. Well, you had talked about the difference between the drug cartels right. and the coyotes. So I'm seeing like the correlation with drug cartels and people coming north is not that people are coming north with the cartels, it's that they're coming north to escape the power and influence of the cartels. Ah, uh, so they're not being smuggled in any way, we, paying off drug cartels. We have seen some situations for 
a lot of these cases, the children are brought to the U.S.-Mexican border, and then they're placed into, you know, safe houses or houses where they wait for an opportunity to actually cross into the United States. So they're waiting on the Mexican side of the border. And we have seen situations where at that point in time, um, there are there is a lot of drug cartel activity along the border that drug cartels have taken advantage of those safe houses and tried to exploit those migrants and say, okay, well, if you want to be able to cross into the United States, you're going to have to work for us or we're going to kill you or we're going to kill your family members back in your home country. And so they're given very little choice. They don't have many options in that point. They're alone in this house. They don't know where they are. Adults? Children. Older children? Um, teenagers. Teenagers. I've seen it as young as <clears throat> 13, 14 up to 16, 17. Uh, it does tend to be teenagers in this situation that they're using um, to try to smuggle drugs across the border. And I've seen situations of kids who refuse to do so and put themselves at a lot of danger and a lot of risk when they're in the situation alone. <clears throat> they don't know where they are. They don't know how to continue the journey, but they also don't know how to get back. And they're, they're stuck in the situation and they have to try to strike out on their own and cross the border. So you said you've seen children, you've talked to children mm -hmm. who've been in that position. I have, yeah. And how have they managed? Presumably they did manage. I mean, they, they were, they were <laughs> apprehended by Border Patrol very shortly after crossing the border. Um, and they weren't immediately sent back? Uh, no, they were not. They were placed into this, this shelter system. So for youth who arrive from Central America, um, they do have the right to go to immigration court to fight their immigration case, to present you know, their case for why they should be allowed to stay or why they're eligible to stay and seek protection here in the United States. And so they're placed into the shelter system, which is where they're housed, but at the same time, they're having to go to immigration court, again, on their own, without a government-funded attorney, um, and try to fight their case to stay here in the United States. Now, uh, let's go back to the coyotes. There was mention of the drug cartel. What's the situation with the coyotes? And I assume that these are people who more or less are being paid to take them across. Yeah, so it's a situation in which um, somebody expresses the need to go up north and um, they do contract the services of a coyote to help them along the way. And a lot of times people will take out loans and just pay the, or they have a situation and it's almost like an indentured servitude that once they do make it to the US, they have to work to pay off that coyote. And um, they do it because they're really risking life and limb and everything they have to make it to the US. And um, having a coyote is kind of like a way to make sure that they're not going, you know, it, there's never any guarantee, but it's kind of like a safeguard that they can take that they can come through and they're not going to get killed or get taken advantage of. Unfortunately, it does happen. You know, we hear stories about bad coyotes all the time who will like leave people stranded in the desert or they'll rob them. They'll have like an entire group of people and they'll take everything that they brought with them, all their life's possessions and leave Water them stranded. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's so, so sad. I mean, because we hear about these stories of like adults who are being led up by coyotes and you know being taken advantage of them but with children it happens a lot too and it's something that's just really like sad and shocking for us like especially as immigration attorneys when we hear about these kinds of stories it's like really heartbreaking well I'm thinking it's all shocking it <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah it's just unimaginable <laughs> now getting back to the question of what children would not be eligible Right, yeah. So one remedy I mentioned was special immigrant juvenile status. So let's say they're leaving their home country and they're coming to a situation here where there's a, you know, two parents that are willing to take care of them. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily eligible then because they haven't been abused, abandoned, or neglected necessarily. Um, another thing that they could apply for is asylum. Uh, asylum is if somebody is, uh, has a, you know, a fear of persecution in their home country based on race, religion, nationality, um, social um, group, political opinion. Um, if their fear of persecution is based on one of those five um, areas, they can apply for asylum. However, you know, it's something that comes up with us all the time that we perform these kind of like analyses on clients, do consultations, and we'll rack our brains for everything that they could be eligible for. And many times the answer is they're not eligible for anything. And it is a very big possibility because these forms of relief are hard to get and they require an immigration attorney who's skilled in those areas of law. And even still, um, there's no guarantee. There's never a guarantee. There's always some kind of roadblock that could happen down the line. The immigration judge could say no and deny the case and order their deportation. Uh, you know, citizenship 
Citizenship and Immigration Services can find that they're not eligible for this benefit and say no and then refer the case to the immigration judge who can then deport them. Nothing is ever a guarantee and I feel like I'm reading a lot of things that make it seem like it's easy that once they get here. Uh, no. <laughs> it seems like the whole process it isn't is. easy at all. Yeah, it's so difficult. And one thing that's particularly difficult is a lot of these mm. children really are fleeing for their lives. But a lot of them are fleeing from gangs and drug cartels in their home countries. Um, we're especially seeing the teenagers who are either being recruited to the gangs and told, you know, if you don't join us, if you don't help us, we're going to kill you, we're going to kill your family. Uh, we see extortion, if you don't pay us, if you don't get your parent in the United States to send us money, we're going to kill you. Or for young women in particular, if you don't become my girlfriend, if you don't join the gang in that way, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to rape you. And so these children are fleeing from that situation. But unfortunately, asylum law as it currently stands in the United States doesn't recognize that as a basis for asylum. Gang-based asylum claims are not winning in the immigration court. You would think if you're fearing for your life, mm -hmm. just the fact that you're fearing for your life mm -hmm. is enough to, to of a case to make for asylum. And you're saying it's not. Unfortunately, it's not. And these children, they're, they're terrified. Oh. They're terrified of being killed in their home countries. And, and yet the law doesn't recognize that. So have you had cases where children are sent back? We haven't yet, we don't largely take a lot of asylum cases in our office. Um, they're incredibly resource intensive, unfortunately. Um, and for a small nonprofit, it's difficult. Now when to you say reverse intensive? Sorry, resource. Resource intensive. <laughs> resource yeah. intensive. Um, and for a small nonprofit, it is difficult to be able to, to dedicate the resources uh, to those claims. Um, there is an organization in San Francisco called Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights that focuses on asylum claims and that offers um, free legal services uh, for asylum cases. And so they are advocating to try to get this recognized as a basis for asylum under U.S. asylum law. I would think so. You know of people who've been deported. Children who've been deported. Yeah, I mean, it's we can't speak from personal experience because mm -hmm. we have such a limited bandwidth to take on these cases. So, like, one thing that I tell people and that they're kind of shocked is that there's no right to counsel in immigration proceedings. So, unless somebody has the good fortune of finding an attorney with a nonprofit organization who can offer pro bono services, or if they can afford a private attorney uh, and pay thousands and thousands of dollars representation, otherwise they're on their own and they have to apply for these things on their own and litigate their own cases in the immigration court and immigration law is so complex and it is so difficult to navigate and asking it somebody seems yeah. to me the I can't say the courts are stacked against you but <laughs> uh, everything seems to be stacked against you I mean if, if you're a child mm -hmm. it's so difficult what are you supposed to do I mean I, I'm thinking it's just an incredible experience having to go through all of that just to get here mm -hmm to unknown circumstances and then you have to fight your way through in terms of immigration mm -hmm. law and immigration court and how is one ever supposed uh, supposed to know anything about the law so should one assume most are sent back not most I mean, also, the other thing is that the immigration system is notoriously slow. <laughs> so somebody will come in and they'll be held in the shelter for, you know, let's say two, three months. And then they're assigned an immigration court date for like a few months down the line. Um, let's say that they're applying for some kind of benefit in which they're going to have to have a hearing in the immigration court. It's possible they're not going to have a hearing until two, three years down the line. Yeah, it's just the nature of the beast and, you know, immigration judges, you know, there's never enough judges. Each judge has thousands of people on their docket. They have to set out these cases for years in the future. You know, there's just not enough, I guess, funds with the Executive Office for Immigration Review to have a system in which people can have a speedy trial. Speedy trial is not something that comes up in the immigration context. It's hardly something that might even come up with criminal cases. Yeah, you know, so in the United exactly. States it right. doesn't involve. So if you can imagine, and that's like constitutionally guaranteed for, cri <laughs> for criminal cases or for immigration, it's just like who knows what happens. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we don't have like, you know, like cases that we know that like we're deported because a lot of times, even if we've lost at the immigration court level, there's levels of appeal. So we really, these things can be dragged out for several years, you know, so, but I'm sure that there are cases, you know, we kind of have to cherry pick the cases that have relief so that we can meaningfully use our time. So let's talk about the cases that you have mm -hmm. and the type of immigration work that each of you is working on. 
Sure. So do you want to talk about some of your cases? The, the majority of my cases are the special immigrant juvenile status that Miriam was talking about before. Um, we do see a lot of kids that unfortunately have been abused, abandoned, or neglected. And that can be either by one or both parents. And where do they, how are they referred to you? Um, in a number of different ways. Um, we serve the long-term foster care facility that's located in San Jose. Um, and so a lot of those children in foster care are eligible for special immigrant juvenile status. Um, in the shelter system, there are legal service providers that go to the shelters and provide um, Know Your Rights presentations and do short intake screenings. And those uh, legal service providers will refer uh, cases to us. So let's say a child is in a shelter in Texas, they get a screening down in Texas, that attorney will actually contact our office and say, hey, this child is being reunified with a parent or an aunt or an uncle here in San Mateo County. Uh, can you meet with them and see if you can help them with their case? Um, we also see cases referred by social workers, um, by schools, um, where they, they discover that this child is having to go to immigration court and they'll say, okay, there's this organization in East Palo Alto that might be able to help you. So it is really in a, new, a number of different ways that we get these cases. So you were saying in, in, in many times that children are abused mm -hmm. or... Ab so let's mm -hmm. talk about m maybe, is there a typical case? <laughs> I don't think there is. I don't think, I, I really don't think there is a typical case. Every case is different. Um, and how many cases have you worked on? <laughs> <laughs> Um, right now I have about 95 cases um, and I'd say over half of those are children um, and so so you were just now about to cases, give yeah. to, to give an example um, of an atypical case an atypical case <laughs> <laughs> amongst my cases um, a lot of cases we do see are abandonment uh, where a child just one of their parents has never been in the picture um, unfortunately and so a lot of the times the child, one of their parents has abandoned them, the other parent might say, okay, I can't provide for this child in my home country. There aren't job opportunities here. I financially cannot support this child on my own, so I'm gonna come to the United States so that I can support this child. And they make the very difficult decision of prolonged separation from their child. Then the child, you know, <coughs> grows up, is a teenager, and really, you know, is fleeing both from the instability and insecurity in their home country, but also seeking to reunify with that missing parent, so that at least they have one parent in their lives. Um, and so they'll come to the United States and be reunified with that parent. And those children are eligible for special immigrant juvenile status. So we do see that quite often. Um, we also often see children who are living with an aunt or uncle or grandparent um, who don't have either of their parents available to take care of them. Neither of the parents can, can take care of the, that child. 